What's the date today? Twenty seventh. Oh, the Greek calendar? Oh. What about the Omer calendar? Today is the seventh day of the Omer. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Today is the seventh day of the Omer. Tali, let's put it on. You have a Tali, let's put it on. Baruch Hatah, I'm going to be in the Hatah. I'm going to be in the Hatah. I'm going to be in the Hatah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, the last of the King, set us apart by your established things, and established for us to put on the friendship. Thank you. 
So Shabbat, Shabbat on top of each other. We had a Shabbat and a Shabbaton on top of each other. So Saturday was day one of Hagamatsa. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So yesterday was the seventh day of Hagamatsa, which is also a Shabbaton. So last Saturday was a Shabbaton. Hagamatsa, and yesterday was the Shabbaton of Hagamatsa. So today's the eighth day if you do an eighth day. So we are gonna, I'm gonna teach you about the seventh day, the seventh day of uh, Hagamatsa. what is taught on the seventh day of Hagamatsa. Seventh day of Hagamatsa. So let's go to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. What I'm going to teach is super basic and then a super basic thing on top of that about how to apply it which we talked about at Passover. Exodus 13, I don't even know what verse we're starting at, it's 20. Let's start, uh, verse 17. Now it came about when Paro had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the dead end, by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was closed. By the way, the Sinai Peninsula does not belong to Israel. In the Bible, that's Egypt. That's Egypt, that is not Israel. So the borders that God gave is, of Israel does not include the Sinai Peninsula. Sinai Peninsula, they even called it Sinai. Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula. Where is it? It's Arabia. Thank you, somebody's paying attention. I need some class participation here, guys. Where is, where is Mount Sinai? Saudi Arabia, it says in the Galatians. So they had to go way east to go to the mount, to uh, Mount Sinai. All they had to do was jump up straight north and they'd have been in the way of the, the, the land of the Philistines. That's all they had to do. Go from the Sinai Peninsula, which is what? Not, not which is what? Not. Egypt. It's Egypt. Thank you. More class participation. Thank you, Daniel. Come on, guys, wake up. What, what is the Sinai Peninsula? Egypt. Yeah. Egypt. Yeah. So even though they're in that big, giant space of what is called the Sinai Peninsula, that's part of Egypt. So that's why it's saying this here. All they had to do is jump north. They'd be in the land of the Philistines, which is kind of odd. So God said, I'm not taking it that way. I'm taking you down and far west. So God didn't lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near, because God said, or else the people will change their minds when they see war, and they'll just go right back to Egypt. So God led the people around, around, by the way of the wilderness to the Reed Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. And Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him, because he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall surely carry my bones up here with you. Now that's the verse that we're going to be dealing with. Let's read it again. Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him, because he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God shall surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here with you. Now this has two doubles in it. This verse, it has two doubles in it. Like Hebrew words that are double, like uh, strong, strong arms. Only it has two sets of them. Truly, truly. Like truly, truly, like, yeah, exactly. And it has two sets of them. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So. We're going to talk about the coming of God is double. This is what I'm going to talk about. The coming of God is double. He doesn't just come once, he comes double. This is important. It's basic stuff, but it's important. 
You all know that there's two comings of the Messiah, right? Yes. Wrong. There's three. Oh, no. <laughs> there's not two, there's three. Yeah. Thank the Bible never says the second coming, ever. Not one single time. Ever. What it says is it's a second time. He comes a second time. It never says second coming. That's a Christian mythology that was invented by Christians because they read it and they didn't read the passage carefully and they went, well, oh, second, I mean, uh, uh, a, a coming, a coming again. That's a second coming, but it's not. It is a second coming, but then there's a third. So the way we're gonna say it is, the way I'm gonna say it, the way I'm gonna teach it to you is a second time. He's coming a second time. Not a second coming, a second time. That's what we're going to talk about first. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look at uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 passages about what they call the second coming, but it's not the second coming. It's the third coming, but it's coming a second time in some of the passages. <coughs> Hopefully this will get clearer. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 23. This is about the resurrection. The whole passage, the whole chapter is about the resurrection. Let's go for verse 20. Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So the dead are asleep. Yes? Yes. All right. So Messiah has been raised from the dead, from the sleeping, from the sleep, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by one man came death, by the man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah shall all be made alive, or resurrected. But each in his own order. Messiah the first fruits, after that, those who are Messiahs at his coming. Does it say second coming? No. No, it's just it's not another coming. Second Thessalonians 2, 7 through 8. Two, seven through eight. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and will bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Does it say second coming? No. No. It says his coming. So who is this uh, lawless one? Verse 9. That is the one who's coming. Oh, how about that? There's another coming. Only this is the false messiah's coming. His coming is in accord with the activity of Hasatan, with all power and science and false wonder. All right, so it doesn't say second coming yet. And by the way, it never says second coming, it's the second coming in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It never says it. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. Hey, do you guys find this, that when you're like in God's will and you're hearing it and you're doing good and you're praying and all that, that you can find stuff in the Bible quicker? Yeah. And that when you're just not with it, that it's hard to find stuff in the Bible when you're spiritually not with it? Do you find that? Yeah. I, I definitely find that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I definitely find that. All right, uh, we're going to uh, 1 Timothy 6, 14. Well, verse 13. <clears throat> I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to everything and of Messiah Yeshua who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the meat spot. Who wrote this letter? Who wrote this letter? Shaul? Yeah, Paul. Shaul. And he's talking to Timothy and he tells Timothy keep the meat spot without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Does it say second coming? No. It's just coming again. Another coming. 
a second time. Coming a second time. And then Hebrews chapter 9. This is the most, it's the clearest, it's probably the best one. Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Messiah, also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Does it say a second coming? No, it just says a second time. It will appear a second time for salvation without sin to those who eagerly await him. So Yeshua came once, and he comes what? A second time. Now, in case you don't know, or in case you forgot, Yeshua's first coming was in the year 4000 on the biblical calendar. At the, at the end of the fourth day, beginning of the fifth day. And he will come a second time when? Year 6000 when? Rosh Hashanah. That's right. Rosh Hashanah. Seven months later after Passover. So he died. The first time he came, he came and he died at Pesach. And the second time he comes, he appears at Rosh Hashanah. All right, for the second coming, right? 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 No. no. For coming a second time. Oh, you forget so fast. All right, so coming a second time. All right, so that's basic stuff. And now I'm going to actually teach the Bible. The Bible, or the Okay, so here's the verse that we're looking at. Let's go back to Exodus. And this is what we're going to examine. And by the way, this is taught on the seventh day of Pesach. Verse 17. What chapter will be in? 13. 13, 17. King of Abba Parah let the people go to the garden of Sinai. Which he took the most of Verse 19. Verse 19. Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him. Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him from Egypt to 40 year journey until he got to Israel. That means they carried those bones for 40 years, right? Because Joseph said, I want you to bury me in Israel when you get to Israel. This is one of the most amazing things that's in the Bible. That Joseph, how the heck did he know that the millions of people from Israel were going to go to the promised land? They're, they're, they're in Egypt. He's, you know, like second in command. They're doing pretty good in Egypt. In fact, they're doing really good in Egypt. And he says, in generations, you're going to be going to the promised land. Take my bones with you. So that means he was mummified, and they had to take that mummy. Was he mummified? Yeah. How do you know he was mummified? Because it says it in the Bible that he was mummified. It says that they mummified him. That means they took all the guts out, put him in canopic jars. They gutted him. Took his heart, his liver, his kidney, and put it all in canopic jars. Wrapped his body in, in, in uh, strips with spices. Just like what was done in the shore. And they carried this thing around for 40 years in the desert. No, because he rose. You don't gut the body until I believe it's seventy days after uh, after he's prepared. All right, so nineteen, verse nineteen. Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel swear solemnly swears way it's translated, saying, "God has will surely take care of you." Is the way it's translated. Is you'll carry my bones up to Really, really bad translation. Bad, bad, bad translation. So in Hebrew, it's ki hashbi'ah, hashbi'ah, et b'nei Yisrael l'amor. For swear, they swear, sons of Israel, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here with you. Do you see the double word? Yeah. What's the word? Swear. Yeah, but in Hebrew. You know? Uh, uh, Shabbat. Shabbat. Shabbat or Shabbat. Right. It's uh, hashbi'ah. Hashbia. 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 So the, so the, yes, the second one has a yoga. First one does not. 
Hashbi'a, Hashbi'a. Same word. Same word, Sheva. A Sheva is an oath. So the word Sheva, or Sheva, or Shabua, it's all the same thing, means to make complete an oath, a seven, to, now listen, to seven oneself. To seven oneself. To seven oneself. What does that mean? Is that the same word as Shavuotov? Yes, week. Shavuotov means good week, every week. Shavua, Shabbat, 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 all the same word. So this word, now think about this, to seven oneself. What the heck does that mean? Well, like a, a Shabbat is sevening yourself because you're coming to the seventh day and you're Shabbating, so to speak. Well, an oath is the same thing because you swear, and it might be, I'm not 100% sure about this, but it might be by repeating seven times the oath. A lot of scholars believe that. Some don't. I don't know what to believe. I think it probably is. Or seven witnesses or seven pledges. I don't think that's accurate. Because the scriptures say over and over and over again, how many witnesses are you supposed to have? Two or three. It says over and over by two or three witnesses. But that's a phrase, two or three. It's important that it's not just two, two or three. So that I'm not so sure about the one. That I'm not so sure about, seven witnesses or seven pledges. But I believe this repeating something seven times, I think there's something to that. Yes. Yes, at the, at the wedding, the woman walks around the, the, the husband seven times, and she's sevening him to herself. That's correct. Very good. All right. That's part of the oath. There's also seven blessings at a Jewish wedding. Part of the oath. So, what is, what's going on here? Why is it double? Hashbe'ah, hashbi'ah, et vede Yisrael, lemoah. And for swearing, they swear, the children of Israel, saying, strength, and strength. So what's going on here? Now let's go to Genesis chapter 50, and we'll look at the oath that was made. It's, it's, it's you know, hearkening back to when, Je when uh, Joseph had them make this oath. Oathing, he oathed. Oathing, they oathed to him. Shabbat, yeah. Genesis 50, 24. The very end of Genesis. 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you. There's that phrase again, bad Hebrew. Surely take care of you is nothing like what it said, which we'll talk about. And bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, or swearing they swore the sons of Israel, saying, God will surely take care of you. There's that phrase, it's not here. And you shall carry my bones up from here. So there's two phrases we have to look at. Swearing, he made Israel swear, whatever. And whatever God will take care of you, whatever that is, we're going to look at both those phrases. Because they're both really badly translated. But we can see very, very clearly how many oaths are there? How many oaths are there? How many oaths are there? Say it with words. How many oaths are there? <laughs> You're afraid to answer for some reason. How many oaths are there? The oath is double. How many oaths are there? Wow. The oath is double. How many oaths are there? Two. Everybody say it. Two. 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 The oath is double. There's oathing they oath. Sevening they seven. Swearing they swore. How many oaths are there? Two. Okay. It's written like this for a very, very particular important reason. So that you look at it and you go, sorry. Swear, swear, two swears, two swears, two oaths, and you're supposed to come up with that. It's very, very simple, very basic. Got it? Yeah. Got it? Yeah. No. Okay. I don't know 
know how to make it clearer. I'm sorry. Uh, I thought I made it super clear. The word Sheba appears how many times? Twice. Saintly words. Twice. Two. You're supposed to look at this Hebrew and see the same word two times, and it means swear or oath, and so you go, oath, oath. I can't make it any clearer than that, right? Got it. That's it. That's all I'm saying. So the oath is double. It's, it's simpler than the thing, right? Okay. The oath is double. Now, in the same verse, let's go back to Exodus chapter 13. We're going to keep flip-flopping back and forth in the Bible from other verses to Exodus 13, so you might as well put a marker in there. Verse 19. Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him for swearing, Israel swore, saying, now we're going to deal with the second phrase. Swearing, Israel swore, there are two oaths, yes? Yep. Yes? Yes, yes. Now you're going to see two visits, two visits of God. Because the way it's written in English, God will surely take care of you. That is not what it says at all. It says, visit, he will visit God, you. Visit, he will visit you, God will visit you. And you will take up my bones from here with you. Yes. Say it again. The King James Version says visit. Huh. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's correct. King James has the word visit. It says, Does it yeah. have it twice? Yeah, well, no. You think so. Visit you, visit Does it have it twice? No. Sure. That's right. In Hebrew, it's twice. Mine says remember. Pako, remember is good too, by the way. Pako, Yifko. Say Pako. Yifko. Yifko. Say pakod, yifkod. Same word, only different tense. So no. Visit, he will visit God, you, and you will take up my bones from here with you. So there's two doubles in this verse. There's oathing, they oathed Israel. And visit, he will visit you. Isn't that weird? Yeah. In the same verse. There's two doubles. And you're supposed to look at that, Mary, and you're supposed to go, oath, oath, visit, visit. Why? Well, whenever anyone speaks, whether, and especially when God speaks, but anyone speaks, when they say it twice, they want your attention. And right. they, they want to make sure that you hear mm -hmm. what they have said. Mm -hmm. Yes, when anybody speaks, especially God, if you repeat it twice, you are trying to get your attention, and it's also called emphasis. In the Bible, when you have doubles, you have immediate emphasis. So, absolutely right. Yep. So you're supposed to pay attention to this in the Hebrew go, oath, oath, visit, visit, or remember, remember. Remember is a good translation, by the way. Remember or visit. Now, the word pikud or pakad is a huge word. It's used in many, many, many different ways in the Bible. But these are the basic ways it's used. To strike up or against anyone. In other words, to, to get up, like get in somebody's face. To like get over next to somebody so that you're with them. To get up against somebody so you fight them. To get up next to somebody so you hug them. That's pakad. That's the basic root meaning of the word. But it also means to go to somebody because you know, you're going up next to somebody. Or to visit somebody. Now we think of visit as, oh, I'm going to go visit. You know, let's have a nice chat. Not what it means. Visit in the Bible is something completely different. And it's where the word remember comes in. In Judaism, how do you remember? Do you know? By showing up. Not by showing up. Say that again. Talk. That's it. With your mouth. You remember with your mouth. You do not remember with your memory. In your brain. 
You remember by saying stuff. Remember in Judaism is words. It's, it's using your words, using God's words. God saying words. That's one way to remember. Now, it's, uh, there's a different word in Hebrew for remember. But this also means remember because you're going to somebody. So visit means a coming. A coming. How many comings are there of Jesus? Three. 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 <laughs> the simpler I make it, the harder it is. How many comings are there? Three. Right. When Yeshua comes again, that's called what? Coming a second, a, a second time. So, Generally, we say there's two comings of Yeshua, right? Came the first time to provide salvation, comes the next time for judgment and to set up the kingdom. That's basic. That's a visit. God showing up is God visiting. Mm -hmm. It's the word pakad or piku. I wanted to name one of our kids piku. Becca, you dodged the bullet. <laughs> I was gonna, I wanted, I told Eileen, I want to call a child Piku. And she was like, oh, that's a horrible sounding name. But to me, it was like, man, I love it. It's like, visit, like God's showing up. I love that word. I still love it. It just sounds like, Piku, come here. What is it in Spanish? Like, it sounds like Piku. Oh, Piku. Are you dead? Okay, whatever. All right, cool. So, now look at this. It means to visit, to attend to, like go to somebody, help them, to muster, gather people together, to number. This is used many, many, many times. This word makah is used almost exclusively, almost, not quite, exclusively in the book of Numbers when they number the people. Over and over and over and over again. Makah, to number, to reckon, to punish. This is literally used when people strike somebody else. To punish. To appoint, to look after, to care for. So I hope you're starting to get a general sense of the word. This is why it's visit, or now I've got to teach you about remember, because it's strange in the Jewish culture, remembering is not like in, in America. It's not, oh, I remember again, you a nice guy. That's not remembering. Remembering is, Oh, I was such a jerk. I can't believe it. You know what I did? That's remembering in the Jewish, in the Jewish world. You know what I did? Get, let me tell you what I did. That's a Jewish remembrance. Here's $10,000 for that project. That's a remembrance. In Judaism, nothing gets done without money to remember somebody. The remembrance, the other word for remember. So, how many times does God visit in the verse? Twice. Twice. Two times. How many oaths are there? Two. Two. How many visits are there? Three. Three. No, visits. I'm talking about the verse. How many visits are there? Two. Okay. So that's why there's, quote, a second coming. Because Yeshua visits twice. He comes twice. God comes twice. And this is how we live. God comes the first time to go like this. What did he do? What did he do? And the second time after you go, you know what I did? Then he comes for a different reason. Yes. Oh, I got it backwards. I'm sorry. Et. <laughs> I put it backwards. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm sorry, Hebrew's backwards. It should be out of top. Et. Et. It's not my bones. Okay, that's <laughs> Thank you. Okay, how many oaths are there? Two. How many visits are there? Two. All right, now let's talk. How many oaths are there? Two. In the verse, how many? Visits are. Okay. That's why there's a quote, second coming. A coming a second time. 
Now, let's talk about the word piku, the pakon, as remembrance. This is really a big concept in Judaism. Now, remember, we're Passover. The seventh day of Passover. We're telling the story of the Exodus, and we're eating matzah to remember the story of the Exodus. And we remember our coming out of slavery, right? We remember our coming out of slavery. How do we remember coming out of slavery? Where, when, how? Say it again. At the Seder. What do we use at the Seder to tell about our coming out of Thank you. And we got it right except that the Zerah. I'm sorry, the Haggadah. The Haggadah. But he got the top, the Levincha, and you shall tell your son. You shall tell your son. And that's why we use the Hagai, the Passover. So, let's talk about remembrance. Kikun is remembrance. God will visit, will remember, he will visit, and you will take up my bones from here with you. Now think about this. Joseph had made them make an oath. Oathing they will oath Israel to take his bones up, carry it around for 40 years, and take this mummy up to Israel. It was like a seed. You know, I, I was, I'm not gonna talk about it. Nobody gets this right, I don't know why. That coffin, that, that, that mummy was like a seed. It was faith that Joseph said, in the future, you're going to carry my bones up to the promised land. You know, things are really good here in Egypt. And then you're going to go suffer for 230 years, not 400. You're going to suffer for 230 years in Egypt. And then carry my bones up for 40 years and you're going to come to the promised land. Oh, yeah, right. So it was like a little seed that was faith that he was saying, Get this thing up into Israel. Yeah. Well, you said a seed. A seed. They said, least it die and abide alone. Then for the three, four, the one. That's exactly right. That's where it was going. Yeshua said, unless a seed dies in the ground, it won't produce anything. It has to be dead. It has to be in the ground. In order for faith to produce anything, there must first be what? Death. 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 Let me say that again. In order for faith to produce anything, there must first be a death. So Yeshua said, must bring a, a, a grain of uh, whatever. He was talking about wheat or barley. Unless that seed, that grain goes into the ground and dies, it doesn't produce anything. So what Jake, Joseph was doing was getting a seed himself, his body and say, get this seed up into Israel. And that was the only thing from the patriarchs in Israel. The only thing. We didn't have anything else except that little seed. And they didn't work there. And then they finally, 40 years in the wilderness, and they finally got up there and put that seed right smack in the middle of the land of Israel. Anybody know where? Where was he buried? Where was Joseph buried? The bones? No, that's Hebron. Right in the middle of the land. Nobody knows you read the book. You read the book. You don't remember? Shechem. Work up some spit. Say Shechem. 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 S-H-E-C-H-E-M. Shechem. The ridge of the shoulder. Shechem. It's up right smack in the middle of the land. Joseph said, as prophecy and as faith, the time will come, you're going to bury me there. Now, this is a big deal because there's two comings of God in this verse. So he says, God will remember you. He will, he will remember. Remembering, God will remember. And you will take up my bones from here with you. Let's go to Joshua 24. And here's where they actually ended up in Israel, they actually, at the end of the book of Joshua, 
not the beginning. They finally get his bones into into uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Joshua chapter twenty four verse thirty two. Now they buried the bones of Yosef, when the, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem. In the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. Very end of Joshua. How long did it take him to take the land of Israel? That Joshua was, was uh, helping them do this? How long did it take? Say it loud. 40 years? 40 years? That's right, 40 years. So, 40 years in the wilderness. And then another 40 years to take the land, and finally they got Joseph's bones into Shechem. So, 230 years, another 40 years, another 40 years. That's how long they had to wait. Almost 400 years to finally get those bones planted like a seed in the middle of Israel. That's why Joseph's bones are such a big deal. That's why they're at the end of the book of Genesis and the end of the book of Joshua. It is an incredibly huge, important concept, and nobody talks about this. I don't know why. Is Joseph a picture of Yeshua? Yes. Remember I taught that last year, or maybe the beginning of this year? He's a picture of Yeshua. It was last year. A picture of Yeshua. In many, many, many points. Well, so is his death. Okay. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 21. Now, Say it again. Uh, that he was buried. Where was he buried? Where did he die and was buried? No, where did he die and was buried? Died in Egypt. In Egypt, not in Israel. So he had to come back to the Jewish people in Israel, just like Yeshua. He's outside of the Jews outside of Israel, he has to come back a second time. So that's why his bones are such a big deal. That it's a picture of the coming of Yeshua a second time from outside of Israel. Make sense? And 400 years they had to wait. They had to wait a long time between Yeshua coming for salvation and then coming again to set up the kingdom. Yes, it says uh, in Meek, I believe. Out of Egypt, I called him to be my son. I believe it's Meek chapter 2. That's correct. Okay, so Genesis chapter 21. Genesis 20, 21, verse 1. It's about Sarah. The Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. That is weak. Not what it says in Hebrew. Yours says visited. That's good. Spoken. Spoken. Not good. Remember. Remember is good. Yeah. Spoken. Not good. Remember. Remember is good. This is the word Pekad, Pekud. God remembered or visited Sarah. He visited Sarah. He remembered Sarah. This is the word Pekah. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. This is when God is talking with Moshe at the burning bush. And he says in verse 13, Moshe said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel. I'll tell them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What am I going to say to them? Why do I have that verse? Oh, verse 12, sorry. He said, certainly, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign with you that it, that it is I who sent you when you brought the people out of Israel, out of Egypt, you shall worship. I believe that's the verse. That where it says, I will be with you, can you check me in Hebrew? Verse 12, it's the word haka. I believe that's the verse. And then, it says it again in chapter 4. Oh, it's 331. That's what it is. It's 331. We got the, no, there is no 331. That can't be it. 431. Let's go to the next one. Sorry about that. So 
So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord, now this is the word, Hakkad, that the Lord visited or remembered them, that's when they believed. When they heard that God visited them, that's when they believed. And they immediately turned up their mind and said, I don't believe that. But for that moment, when they heard that God visited, they believed. If I could only give you the verse in Exodus chapter 3 that they heard, but you get the idea. Oh, I think I found it. Verse 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Yeah. Who are in Egypt and have given the heed to their cry. That's it. No, that's not it. Take it back. Well, it's in there somewhere in chapter 3, where it says that he put on the remember. All right. First Samuel two twenty one. First Samuel two twenty one. And the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three. She conceived because God visited her. What does that mean? That must have been. Good visit. 316. 316. What did I put? 313. All right, Exodus 316 is what it is. It says, I have remembered you and seen your affliction. I have remembered you. I have visited you. All right, so back to 1 Samuel. It says, The Lord visited Hannah and she gets pregnant. Let's say it again. That must have been a good visit. You're like Lenny Bruce. Mm-hmm. Lenny Bruce said that God is like a comedian that everybody's afraid to laugh at. Right. God's showing jokes and everybody's afraid to laugh. That must have been a good visit. Right. Uh-huh. That God, right. God shows up and boom, she gets pregnant. Yeah. He visited her. What does that mean? He remembered her. Mm-hmm. He visited her. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. It's the same exact thing that happened to Israel when they were suffering in Egypt. And God shows up at the burning bush and he's talking to Moshe and he says, I, I visited, I remembered them and, I, and I've seen their suffering. That's a good visit. Remember, remembrance is done how? Talking. Right, with the mouth. So it's a promise, it's an oath. It's an oath. How many oaths were there? No. In that verse, it says that swearing, they'll swear to bring my bones up. And visiting, he will visit you and you'll bring my bones up. How many oaths? How many visits? So there's something going on here. There's something going on here with when God shows up, he visits. There's like an oath given, a word, a promise, faith given. And she gets pregnant. Seed. There's the seed again. Yes, sir. Is that why it says faith cometh by hearing? It doesn't say cometh. Faith, say it again. Faith comes with hearing? No. Faith, faith comes by or through hearing. And hearing comes from the Word of God. Faith comes through hearing. And hearing comes through by the word of God. In other words, the word of God gives you hearing, and then when you hear, you get faith. So the word That's right. You. And the word will speak to you if there's an oath or a promise or faith given when God does what? Visits. Oh. Visits. What? Visits. Shows up. Okay. We did first. Okay. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 5. We're going to look at several verses. We go over these in Passover. But I just want to skip through them real quick. Deuteronomy 5.15. Would take notice make sense? Uh, take notice is not too bad. It's not too bad. For the word Hakkad. 5.15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Yes? Yes. You shall remember. We say these at Passover. Deuteronomy 15.15. 15. Basically says the same thing. 
and you shall remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 16, verse 12. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Be careful to do the beast of Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. Verse 18. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you from there. And then Deuteronomy 24. Verse 22. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. So I'm charging you to do the same. Over and over again, God says in Deuteronomy, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. It doesn't just mean we were a slave in Egypt. Uh, we were a slave. God redeemed up with a mighty hand and without stretch arm. We were slaves in Egypt. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your redemption. And so we eat crackers with no flavor. <laughs> Not what's going on at all. So, obviously, we're supposed to remember what? Slavery. What slavery? Remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Yeah. Well, how is that possible? We weren't slaves in Egypt. We so therefore, we Egypt, oh, yeah. Egypt therefore <laughs> is obviously not Egypt. It's a picture of, of sin. So, remember we talked about this at the Seder. This is one of the biggest things, the biggest things in the Haggadah that everybody drops out from the Haggadah. And they drop it out from the Haggadah because they want a short Seder. And they don't want to make it go long. And so they drop this phrase out. So even if we were all aged men and all familiar with the Torah, it is enjoined on us to tell of the departure from Egypt. Everybody who looks at it, but here they drop this out. And whoever tells the most about the departure from Egypt is worthy, worthy of praise. Whoever talks about the departure from Egypt the most is the one who is praised. Let me tell you what a jerk I am. That's what it's talking about. When we remember our slavery, now I know this goes, like I said at the Seder, I know this goes counterintuitive to Christianity. I know that. I'm not, I'm not dumb. I know this. I've been doing this for 30 some years. And I've been told every year by Christians, every single year, that really shouldn't. Do you want us to do that? The one who tells the most of his or her departure from their slavery. If you believe, if you, you don't have to believe this, but if you believe that Egypt is a picture of slavery, your slavery, if you truly believe that, then you need to talk about the slavery. You'll see. You'll see. I'm about to share. Good question. Think about that. If you really believe that, or if this is such a fairy tale book full of stories, oh, this means that, this is a metaphor for that, and this is, oh, thank you, Lord, for the metaphor. If that's what you think, Judaism can do nothing for you. The Holy Spirit can do nothing for you. Nothing. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who said, visit, oathing, they oath. Visit, I will visit. Bring my bones up there in faith, which is a crazy thing to do. God is the one who said over and over, remember your departure, remember your, your departure from Egypt. Remember, how do we remember? With the mouth. Okay. The New Testament was written as if you already know the Old Testament, right? right? It was written by Jews in a Jewish culture to Jews and Gentiles who were joining themselves to Jews. Everything in it, the Jews knew. Everything. They knew it was being quoted. They knew what it meant. They knew what it was referring to in the Old Testament. They knew. So if you read something in the New Testament about this issue, you had better relate it to what it means in the Old Testament and what the Jews know about it because God is known in Judah. Like we say, know the God is known 
in Judah. That's Judaism. So if you read the New Testament, you had better be able to relate it to what it is in Judaism. In the culture, the lifestyle, the quote traditions that God gave to Judah, to Israel. Remember your slavery so that God will visit you. Remember they said, oh, God visited us, and so we believe. Yeah. God, and, and he told uh, he told Moses, I'm gonna visit them in Egypt. Yes? I'm yeah. gonna pakad them. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? yeah. So, relate it to yourself. You're in Egypt, you're in whatever the sin is, you're in whatever the sin is. And God got you out of it. So you gotta talk about the sin and how he got you out of it. It's not enough to say, oh, God got me out. Amen. It's not enough. You gotta talk about the departure from Egypt. You can't do that without talking about the slavery. It's impossible. Go to Jeremiah chapter two. We're gonna talk about this concept. Remember the slavery so that God will visit you. Pakad the slavery so that God will pakad you. Or pikud, I like that for a minute. Pikud your slavery so that God will pikud you, visit you. Is this making sense? I open. Good. Let me go. Jeremiah chapter 2. I think, yeah, verse 14. Is Israel a slave? Or is he a homeborn servant? Why has he become a prey? Look at verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, and hold no water. Is Israel a slave? In this verse, he's saying, no, they're acting like slaves. Oh. Is Israel a slave or a homeborn servant that all these people you know, are able to destroy them? That's his point. Go to John chapter 8. This might be what Yeshua is quoting. Might be. Is Israel a slave? that Assyria is able to come and destroy them? Is Judah a slave that Babylon is going to come, is going to in time come and destroy them? What's the answer? No. What's the answer? No. No. All right, before we look at John, let's do this again. He's saying through Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied to Judah. Israel has already been taken away by Assyria. Was, a, was, was Israel, northern Israel, a slave that Assyria was able to come and take them away? Yes. 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 What were they a slave to? Sin. Sin. Idolatry. Yeah. Yes. And that's why God sent the Assyria to take them away. Yes. And now uh, Isaiah is talking to Judah and he's saying, Judah, are you a slave? That these people can come and take you away? Were they? Yes. It happened. Babylon came, took them away. So what's the answer? Yes. Yes. What were they a slave to? Sin. Okay, this is why I'm saying that it might be that Yeshua is quoting that passage in Isaiah here, 834. Yeshua said, Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It might be that Yeshua was quoting that. I, I think actually he was. Romans chapter 6, and now uh, Shaul also quoted the Old Testament, but he's also quoting Yeshua here. Romans 6, 16 through 18. Don't you know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves to, uh, this is the word, hupotasso, 
which means under the hand of, like under somebody's hand. It's translated as obedience, but it's really under the hand of. Don't you know that when you present yourselves as, as to somebody under their hand as a slave, that you are slave of the one that you are under their hand, either of sin resulting in death, or of submission, is what it says in the Greek, resulting in righteousness. Yes? So, either way, what are you? A slave. You gotta serve somebody. You might. We might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. That's true. Yeah. Yep. Either way, you're a slave. Either way. So you might as well be a slave to, what does it say here? Righteousness. righteousness. Thank you. A slave to righteousness. I will. But thanks be to God that, though you were slaves of sin, you became submissive from the heart to that form of Torah to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. All right. So either way, you're a slave. But if you're a slave to sin, what do you do about it? Remember, Remember your slavery. So God can busy. Hold on. I thought I nailed that down, but apparently not. Let's do it again. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness, right? If you get rid of the sin, then... Hold on. If you get rid of the sin, if you're a slave to sin, and you're not a slave to sin anymore, what do you do to get God involved? Talk about it. Remember your slavery. So God can visit you. You must remember the slavery. <laughs> yes. Like David said, my sin is ever before me. Like David said, my sin is always before me, always in front of my face. That's by choice. That's not like, oh, it's always in front of me, I can't get away. Oh. It's, I'm looking at it and I'm talking about it. It's always there. This is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. This is how Jews live. Now, this is. I know it's difficult, I know it's counterintuitive because it really does form the basis for the difference between quote Christianity and quote Judaism. Not real believing in Yeshua or real Judaism, Judaism, but the religions of Christianity and Judaism, what makes them different is this, this very thing. That Jews talk about their garbage. Christians don't. What is this scripture? Oh, there's a lot of scriptures about it. Oh, that's very popular yeah. Christianity. We say that God throws their sin to the deepest part of the ocean and he remembers it. Not. Yes, people quote a lot of verses. One of them is, uh, they will throw your sin into the depth, into the depth of the sea. And so it will be as far as the east is from the west. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How far is east from west? Yeah. Wrong. Just the opposite. That far. What does Teshuvah mean in Hebrew? To turn. It's that simple. But we think it's like, well, so far away. But it's not. It's, you know what I did? Guess what I did? And then things are good. So they just think that God forgets everything? Not only do they think God forgets everything, they say God forgets everything. Gets everything done. My daughter's asking this because she's not, she wasn't raised in the church. She doesn't know. From where I came from, we always testified when God brought us up. We always. And did you continue to testify? Yes. So long after? We did that constantly because there's that's people fantastic. that don't know what that's, God can do for them. That's, that's fantastic. That's why I'm confused because I've never heard that happen. Yeah, even we, because we were raised in an environment yes. where you, you do that, you talk about it. Yes, they did. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. It's awesome, but believe me, it's rare. Yeah. 
very, very, very rare. I mean, you can't do that in a, yeah. in a mega church, can you? No. <laughs> it's all about positive vibes. Right. Yeah. Very, very rare in the body of Messiah for people to actually do this. Now, go to Jacob or James chapter 5. James chapter 5. James 5, Jacob 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to who? Another. Another. Each other. Not a priest, not a melancholy, not a pastor. Only 6. James 5. Six. James 5, 16. Who wrote this? Jacob, yeah. the brother of Yeshua. Was he Jewish? A little bit. Yeah. Did he know Judaism? A little bit. So he's speaking Jewish words in a Jewish letter to Jews who know Judaism. And he says to these Jews, confess your sins to him. It doesn't mean your past sins. It means your sins. And who do you confess them to? Everybody. Each other. Each other. This is how a synagogue works. Yes. And that's kind of contrary to like the pagan thinking where you just do offerings and sacrifices to the wind or it's it's the it's the, well that's where we're going. About that too. It's the opposite of the pagan way, which is to offer us. Well, to go to priest and silently whisper, right? Whisper your sin in secret. And keep it, keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. And whisper your sin. And then you offer offerings. Up them. Yes. Well, you're saying that. It's not what we do at Yom Kippur. It's what we do every single well, Shabbat. I, I know, but I'm saying that's really not the time because you're going to the like, I did this, I did this, I did this. Oh, you're talking about did we? Yes. Yes, 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 you're right. You're talking about public confession. Yes. Yes, that's correct. But this says confess to each other. Different concept. She's talking about did we at Yom Kippur. You go, for the sin of al het, al het. Yeah. For the sin of this, for the sin of that, for this, right? That's public. Everybody does it. This is different. This is going to somebody and talking about what a jerk you are. Personally. Over and over and over and over every Shabbat. And, smi- and I'm going to show you that. Smiling while you do it. Look, look at me. Smiling while you do it. Not... <laughs> You know what I do? I just don't want to talk about this. There's no such thing in Judaism. It doesn't exist. Oh, it doesn't exist. Okay, let's go to... Now, here's our two things that we're looking at. God will visit double Pakad Pikud Paki, whatever it was, you've called Pakad Pikud God will visit double God visits sin on us, then visits mercy on us. That's why there's two visits. He comes the first time to go, what did you do? Dude, what did you do? Not, what hast thou wrought? <laughs> it's not like that. It's like, what, what did you do? And then after you confess, he visits again for a different reason. All right, now we're going to go through these quick. I just want to show you this concept from the, from the Bible. And it said God visits sin. Visits sin on people. 20 verse 5. You shall not worship them uh, idols or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the sin of the fathers on the children. What does visit mean? I mean, what does Paku mean? Or what else besides visit? Remember, remember, right? Talk about. 
talk about, number, visit, get up next to, right? Get in your face, get in your face right? So, uh, God will visit the sin of the fathers on the children. It means there's got to be words involved. Go to Exodus uh, 32 and 34. Basically it says the same thing. 32, 34. But go now, leave the people where I told you. Behold, my angel will go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit them for their sin. That's the word pakat. When I visit, I'll visit for the sin. I'll visit. Now, what it says in Hebrew is, I'll visit the sin on them. That's what it says. What does that mean? I'll visit the sin on them. Don't worship idols because I'm jealous and I'll visit the sin on the children. Yeah, but what does it mean to visit the sin onto someone? I would say punish. To make them remember? Said yeah, that's punish. right. Sometimes it's translated as punish, right? That's good. That's exactly right, actually. Now, I say the word punish, I know we don't talk punishment, talk discipline. And, but I'm just putting that so that you understand. I'm just saying the word punish so you understand. But that is correct. He visits the sin onto the kid. Is painting none. Okay, Exodus 30. I can see verse 34 7. I'm just saying Alright, uh, Hoshea chapter 2. Now, this is talking to Israel. The prophet is talking to Israel. And he's saying, I'm going to visit your sin on the entire nation, and then you'll be taken away into exile. Like I was talking about earlier. Hoshea 2.23. This is talking to northern Israel, not southern Judah. 2.23. I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have compassion on her who have not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. This might be wrong. And they will say, you are my God. It's a long verse. Do it again, but Oh, I hate when this happens. Well, it's in there somewhere. Right. Say it again. You, you got to be loud enough. Oh, okay, uh, 213. I think that's it. I will visit her. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I will visit her for the days of the Baalim, the ba Baals, when she used to offer sacrifices to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry and follow her lovers. That's it. So that she forgot me. So he says, I'm going to visit the sin onto Israel. And what was the sin in this verse? Baal. Idolatry, the Baals, right? Idolatry. So he's gonna, just like he said in, in Exodus 20, I'm a jealous God. Don't worship a different God because I will visit that sin onto you and your children. All right. Let's go to Jeremiah. No, nope, it's not. Okay, so now we have that, that God visits the sin. In these verses, God visits the sin. By the way, there's a hundred of them. I just picked a few. God visits sin on people. And now, the second visit. Let's say it again. <laughs> what did you do? What did you do? Not, what hast thou wrought? What did you do? It's not like that. God isn't even like that. He's, <laughs> you did what? And he visits the sin. And then when you repent, which we're going to talk about, then he visits again. Here's the second visit. Go to Psalm 80. You are so shepherd of Israel. Oh, you just sung that. Right. Like a flock. That's where this is. That's where this verse is. That song that we sang, Psalm 80. Why do you think I picked the songs that I did? What? 
you know, you're starting to get an inkling of it, but you don't have it. Most of you don't, well, most of you don't have it. So. Go back to Jacob chapter five. James chapter five. This is why there's two visits. Now, you can choose to do this or choose not to do it. It's your, it's your business. I'm not going to force anybody to do this, ever. I used to. Yeah. In my, in my old congregation, I used to force people. I would encourage them. I'd cajole them. I'd yell at them. I'd do anything. I'd use any trick in the book to get people to try this, to do it. that says that Nehemiah screamed and yelled at the priest and pulled some of their hair out. So do it. No, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's, that was not good. The way I did it was not good. So Jacob, chapter 5, verse 16. Well, verse 15. The prayer offered in Emunah will do teshu, tikkun, it will restore, do tikkun, to the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven him. So, confess your sins to each other. Now, how was confession done in the, in the, in the temple? Was it like this? Uh, uh, I this whole thing. Oh my God. I, I lusted, and I, I stayed after work, and I got with her, and I committed is that how it was done? No. no. And first of all, who was the guy or girl? Who was the man or woman confessing to? Everybody else there. Okay, let's back up. Where was confession done? In the temple. Where in the temple? By the slaughtering area. Thank you. By the slaughtering area in the court of the priests or the court of Israel, court of the priests, actually, by the altar. You would bring your own sacrifice. You would kill the sacrifice, not the priest. You, the priest would catch the blood and then bring it up on the altar. Meanwhile, you would cut it up in its pieces. You would sponge the blood out, the excess blood out of the body. You would cut it up in its pieces, give it to the priest. The priest would bring that up on the altar. And then they would cook it, the priests, and they give it to you, and you would eat it in a feast, depending on the sacrifice. The other sacrifices, the priest would eat it in a feast. And this is after confession. You got your animal, you put your hand on the head in the court of the priest, and then you'd say, I committed adultery with the, you name the name of the person, tell the place, Tell the situation, talk about what it was in your heart, and if your heart did wasn't pure and repentant, God didn't accept the offer. And it was this was done in the court of the priest with thousands of people all over the place. There's none of this. And then uh, I took the Lord's name in vain. And There's no such thing. It was an open confession with a smile on your face. Because you know God's going to visit you. Because you see that blood going up on the altar. You see the pieces going up on the altar. And you know you have repented. You've turned. You went. You were going this way. Now you're going this way. That easy. And you're going to be okay. And then you have a feast from the sacrifice. You don't burn up the sacrifice. That's only the whole burnt offering. That is not a sacrifice for sin. It's an offering. You're giving it. Here, take this, God. Take the whole thing. That's not a sacrifice for sin. A sacrifice for sin was eaten by the offering, but most of it. Some was given to the priest. And you'd eat together. You'd have a big old feast. What? Who, who were you with? Oh, I was with that, that girl. I was with Jezebel and... <laughs> Yeah, and, and where were you? Oh, I was over in that field over there by the soccer field. And you talk about it, and you talk about what you did. 
confess your sins to who? Each other. Each other. Each other. When was this written? Was there a temple when this was written? Yes, there was. This is in the this is before 70 AD. Oh, okay. When the temple was destroyed. The book of Jacob was written in 40 or 50 before the temple was destroyed. In other words, okay. the Jews were still going to the temple, weren't they? Yeah. Right? And they were still giving sacrifices. And in that context, he says, confess your sins to everybody, and you will be healed and restored. Now, I know this goes totally against what you've been taught. I know it does. I'm not stupid. And it takes a lot of practice to do this because we don't trust human beings with our secrets. We don't. Well, we weren't raised in that culture. Sure. Were. Well, even if you are raised in a Jewish culture where you talk about your, your garden, it's still you know, hard to trust people. Okay, then you're going to start first. <laughs> good answer. That's a good answer. Well, if you say it out publicly, it doesn't matter. Everybody knows. So regardless of Double can't use it against you. Exactly right. If you get out in the open, Hasatan, and demons that are assigned, they can't use it against you. They can't. It's our secrets that make us a prey to the enemy. And the person that would be caught in sin. Yeah, if you get caught in sin, it's even worse. Yeah, it keeps you, it, but hold on, but it keeps you safe from getting into a stupid situation because if you're accountable to everybody, you won't get caught doing something stupid. Right. So, I, I, I just want to, I want to end it there because I know this is a lot to digest, but I just want to show you that this is repeated over and over and over again in Judaism. Every year, the one who tells the most about coming out of your garbage, our garbage, is the one who is praised. The one who is praised. Praiseworthy. So this is only the second time I've ever said this in Let's See Home. First time was at Passover last week. This is the second time. So now that it's out there, probably going to be talking about it more. This is how Judaism frees us. You've got to practice it. And I'm going to give you a warning. Oh, there's a warning. Is that like because it's like medicine? Well, let me give a warning. It's oh, called. I see what you did. Yes, this is the warning label on the time that is in Disclaimer. So here's the warning. Here's the warning. Do it with a smile. The second you lose your smile and you're doing the confessing, you're done for. Because the, because the shame is going to accompany the words that you speak. And if you're being talked to, confessed to, don't you dare lose your smile. Don't you dare lose your smile. It's not a laughter, smile. Right. It's not laughing at it. Well, you can do that too. Don't lose your smile. Because we have all tried to tell people about our junk, and some idiot went like this. You did. You know, that is displeasing unto Hashem. That is displeasing unto the Lord. That is unholiness. And just that quick, you're right back there with the shame. Yeah? Yep. You know what? You've all felt this, right? Uh, no? Yeah. 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 So, here's my warning. If you're going to confess or be confessed to, do it with a smile. Try it. Just try it. It's going to feel really weird. It's going to feel, it's like an AA meeting, only with people smiling. Or one of those group meetings you attend, yeah, like, the group like we meetings. say, you're only as sick as your darkest secret. Right. You're only as sick as your darkest secret. That was oh, yeah, that's true. Okay. 
Yes, sir. It's so good. Uh, That's it. The sorry. reason for smiling is because you know uh, you're coming from. No, no. No. The reason for smiling is to make sure that you don't go back into shame right. and the other person can't judge you. This happens to me 50 times a day at school, by the way. <laughs> the kids try to judge me constantly because I'm really open and honest because I'm constantly teaching from the artwork. When I teach art, I'm teaching from the artwork about my life and I'm teaching from their artwork about their life and about my life. So I'll say, oh, you know that, don't make that mistake. Don't make, don't put that in your piece. I'll tell you why. Because you're not being honest. What do you mean you're not being honest? Because you told me this was your story and you're not showing the truth of it. Let me tell you the story what happened to me. And then I'll tell them about the story. And they're like, they, they instantly go like this. Uh, <laughs> right? Like, oh, you're <laughs> and so I tell it like this. And this is what I did. Can you believe that? And they, they, they keep trying. And I'll go, what do you think of that? And some of them will retain that because they're, they're so deeply entrenched in a world of shame and guilt that they'll go, I don't think you should say that out loud. And I'll, I'll just stay on. Well, you know what? I, I think you should think about it. Think about being honest in your peace. I'll talk to you in a while. And then come back and I do it again, and again, and again, and again. And after a while, they start feeling more comfortable with me, and they start like matching my face, and I'm like this. <laughs> so it takes practice, it takes practice, but uh, try to do it without fear. All right, that's all I want to say, let's pray. Lord, thank you that the one who teaches the most, and tells the most, and confesses the most about their departure from, that our departure from Egypt, from our sin, is the one who you, you praise the most. The one that you lift up the most. And I thank you, Father, for your joy. Thank you so much for your joy. <laughs> Restoring our joy to us. Because we know what garbage, what idiots, what fools we are. And how amazing your mercy is and your grace and your, your Rahmanis, the, the, the turning over of your, your guts and mercy for us is. And thank you, Father, for restoring us in the name of the short ring to whom, because you come again for restoration. You come a second time for resurrection, for, re for restoration. Thank you, Father. Teach us how to do this, Lord. Teach us. You've got to teach us. There's no way we can know how to do it. Because it's not how we are. So I ask that you teach us how to confess to each other so that we can be healed. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Let's do Kiddush.